The following program is a Town of Colony television production of the William K. Sanford Town Library. It goes all my life's a circle, sunrise and sundown. The moon rolls through the night time till the daybreak comes around. And all my life's a circle, but I can't tell you why. Season spinning round again, the years keep rolling by. Top of the day, I'm Joe Doolittle. And I'm Kate Dudding. And this is Story by Story. Celebrating the human spirit. And the human spirit echoes in all of us, and it echoes in the stories that we listen to and that we tell and that we remember on those moments when we're driving down the road having a little thought about something that happened years ago. You know? Pay attention when you're driving, Joe. Okay, okay. I, I will, I will. And, and please, <laughs> please pay attention for the next hour, because we've got, we've got a, a wonderful story about a place that's still in our community that's a treasure mm -hmm. and that uh, had one of the most important things happen in it in our whole history and it's just down the road <gasps> ah, <stay tuned. laughs> but tell me what you've been up to in the storytelling world Kate well I had a wonderful thing happen yesterday uh, once a month I volunteer and go to two nursing homes near my home and I tell to people who, in one case, they have some sort of dementia, and in the other place, they're, most of them are seriously out of it. There I am called stimulation. <laughs> but at, yesterday, when I told at the uh, dementia place, I decided I would tell some family partic participation stories because I'll be doing them on Saturday uh, at a gig. And I thought, well, stimulation, you know, mm -hmm. I, I won't make them follow, you know, the squeaky door, squeak. I won't make them do it because I don't think many of them could do it. But they could, they could enjoy me doing all these things. And there were two women in the front row. They laughed at everything I said. Mm. <laughs> and and they, they were, they were, most of them were with me. Well, there was the lady in the back row who was kind of like this. And the lady over there in the front row, she wasn't quite glaring at me, but she, she didn't have a happy expression on her face. But in between the stories, I, I sing, we sing songs mm -hmm. that they would know. But I always end with God Bless America. And you know, everybody sing, was singing that. Even the lady like this. So, her so eyes were still closed, but she, she was, was singing. singing. And the lady who didn't look too happy, well, she wasn't singing, but when I looked over at her, and I believe I had my friendly, welcoming look, right, and not right. the, why aren't you singing look, uh, she started singing too. So you, so. so you end the show the way Kate Smith ended her TV yes. show. Yes. Aww. Without the handkerchief. Without yeah. the handkerchief. <laughs> yes. That's good. That's good. Yes. So uh, that was... I, I mean, I, I had them. In that moment, we were, we were together. So, Do you know that the Philadelphia Flyers end their hockey games with God Bless America? No, I didn't know that. Bit. And Kate Smith was from Philadelphia, and that's oh. the carryover somehow in that whole mm -hmm. little tradition of that song. Hmm. It's a good song. It's a it's a beautiful song, and I I, ha I always say, and Irving Berlin never made a penny off of that, because as soon as he published it, he it gave all the rights to the Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts of, of America. America. That's right. That has made thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars for them. That royalty. Wow. I didn't know that. Yes. Wow. Now you thought you were just going to be entertained today, <laughs> but now you've actually learned something. <laughs> And, and um, one of my men mentors, Elizabeth Ellis, likes to quote an Irishman who said, said, story should entertain in the moment and give a memory worth having. Give a memory worth having. Oh, there's a good line. Yes. I wish I'd thought that up myself. <laughs> I think I'll take credit for it the next time I use it, though, but that's okay. Uh, 
I've had a little bit of a, of a visiting joy, I'll call it. Mm -hmm. I'm part of the Schenectady Nykirk Exchange, which mm -hmm. is the sister city in the Netherlands that Aaron Van Curler, who founded Schenectady, uh, and Killian Van Rensler, who, who bought most of this land originally from the Indians, came from. And it's been delightful. And uh, I got to lead a tour of Fort William Henry for the Dutch oh. and oh. tell stories of uh, the battle and the lake. and. Um, and I had more fun than I really deserved, actually, I gotta say, telling those historical stories. And uh, we're blessed with a, with, a, uh, with a couple who we've known over the years through the exchange. And he just retired as a physician over in the Netherlands. Oh. And the first visit I met them on, we were touring his garden, and there were a group of us. And he's got a lovely garden, and there was this tree there, and I said to him, Dr. Jan, What's this tree called? And he tried to find the word in English. He wasn't coming up with it, so he grabbed a leaf mm -hmm. and put the leaf over the private parts of his body, and right away we all knew it was a fig tree. <laughs> So he is known in my house as Dr. Figleaf. <laughs> and, and when I send him an email, I send it to Dr. Figleaf. You know, so, so it's been fun to get reconnected. And the stories over the years we've been doing it are, are accumulative uh, in terms of things. That I can't believe you found a kindred spirit. Oh, I did. He, he actually makes me laugh more than I make him laugh. He, he's just delightful. Uh, and there are two members of the Greater Exchange. There's two Dr. Yans. And we've, we've spent time with both of them, and they are just both effervescent mm -hmm. as, as spirits. Mm -hmm. um, that's like champagne is an effervescent spirit. Uh -huh. Okay, exactly. Um, but we've got, so we've had a, a good time, and the Schoharie Crossing uh, Summer Series was a really strong uh, presentation this year, so uh, that'll happen again next year. So if you missed it, we'll talk about it again next year. Um, we've got a wonderful guest with us. Uh, the story of a place just down the road called the Van Schaik, Van Schaik Mansion. Um, and Joanna Shogun is with us. And Joanna Shogun is, I think, the president of the Gainsworth chapter of the Daughters of the American Revolution. I got that one out. <laughs> but we know her as a story listener and a very active proponent and appreciator of stories. And uh, we've planned an event there later in October, which is going to be very special. But the house is very special, and its story is very special. So, Joanna, welcome today to Story by Story, and thank you for bringing your spirit uh, to, to the camera. Thank you for inviting me. This is a really fine, fine opportunity. Thank right. you. And tell us, you know, tell us about who, I know there's been Skike Island that is really where most of Cohoes is, uh, but tell us a little bit about how this family and, and house came to be where it is just along the Hudson River. Okay. Um, well, it goes back to 1652, whenever Hosen, uh, it would look like Goosen, but the Dutch oh. don't say Goose. They said, Goose. so Holson, Van Skyk, and Philip Schuyler purchased a property called the Half Moon Patent, and it straddled both sides of the Hudson and went almost to um, Saratoga. And they did nothing with it, and it was actually Holson's grandson, Anthony, who was getting married, and he built the house in 1735-ish. And um, it, it was built as a, as a fortress. It was a headquarters during the French and Indian War. It was a trading post, and it was a uh, headquarters during the American Revolution. So this is yes. in Cohoes. This is in Cohoes. And actually, uh, Van Skyk Island is a part of the great city of Cohoes. Right. There are many islands that are formed by the Mohawk whenever it's coming into the Hudson. Mm -hmm. It's one of them. And then, of course, there's Cohoes proper, which right. is part of the mainland. Mm -hmm. But yes, it is It is a part of Cohoes. And does Cohoes, I've always wondered, what does Cohoes mean? Does it? That's a wonderful question. Oh. <laughs> I'm not really sure. I could come up with some answers. I think, um. it, has, I, I think it has something to do with the waterfall, but I'm not sure. Well, the, it's the Cohoes Falls, and the it was a place of peace. Mm -hmm. And Native Americans from all over um, the Northeast would come there with their families, and they would vacation. It was a place of fishing. It was a place of relaxation, a place of incredible beauty with the falls, right. absolutely. So thank you for asking. That is a, a wonderful feature of Cohoes, and it's a, it's a beautiful landmark. Right. I, 
I bring visitors there in the winter time. I brought somebody there in July when most of the water is being diverted right. for the yeah. the barge canal, and I went, well, well, you see that edge of the lake? <laughs> yeah. When the water's but flowing, it goes all the way. Look at this but, picture. Yes. <laughs> yes. But but we, 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 but back to the Van Skykes. Okay. So Anthony, I love that name. I can say it Anthony, so easily. Right. Anthony <laughs> Van Skykes <laughs> built it approximately 1732. 35. 35. Yeah. About 32. That's yeah. that's five-ish. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Now, now the the house was built in 1735, and at at, at that time, that was really on the northern perimeter that was of, the wilderness. of life. That it was, was in the wilderness. wilderness. Yes. So this was a big deal to move that far up the river and build a house for your new family. It was, and the river was the road. Right, the river was the road north. Yeah, and yeah. and moving forward, when the revolution started, the the Schuylers and the Van Skykes were on the side of the Americans, rebels. Absolutely were. Uh, because they were Dutch and really didn't like the English to begin with. Um, but well, <laughs> and there were other reasons, it looked like on your face? Um, I, th I think it was a mutual dislike of one another, yeah. Yeah, yeah it um, wasn't that the Dutch, I think that the English also. Yeah, were. it was, and uh, yeah. the the nature of the of the location was that as the war settled in, the British had devised this strategy of splitting the colonies with mm -hmm. General Burgoyne coming from the north, General St. Ledger or... Sillager. Sillager is the... We never knew that pronunciation until today. Uh, and then and General Howe was supposed to come out from New York. Following the rivers. Following the Hudson the, and the Mohawk. Right. And, and come down the Champlain uh, Valley. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the, the Van Skykes had this house that was at a very strategic location because it was literally at the junction of, of those waterways. The, the confluence. I love that word. Confluence. The confluence of the Mohawk and the Hudson. Oh, there you go, showing off your college <laughs> education. Again. Well, it, it, it's, just, it just, it's just a word that flows like the water. Like the waters, yes. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Okay. Strategic place at the confluence. Yeah. And so at that, at that junction of trying to figure out uh, what to do, the Van Skyke said, "You can use our house as a place to meet and 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 the, live and live." And the Cohoes community actually became the staging area for the armies. Exactly. And uh, that's the People's Island uh, historic site, the Chike Mansion, so that those islands and the banks were really full of supplies and soldiers uh, preparing to do battle wherever the battles were going to be fought. Whoa. And moving supplies north to fight Burgoyne and west to take on St. Ledger. And if they didn't really think Howe was coming, but if he did come, they were going to try to take him on too. Mm -hmm. So it was like the, uh, the epicenter of all the strategy for those soldiers, the, those armies. Philip Schuyler was in charge for most of that logistically, right? Mm -hmm. and, uh, and he had a spy network. He did. He, have, did. he had a spy network. Yes, he, he was. A, he was a well-networked guy. He's a story in his own time, uh, and so a lot went on there. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that. But I want to jump ahead a little bit uh, to because of the historical significance of this house, your organization acquired it relatively recently, but did the Van Skykes live in it for a long time? Okay, the, the Van Skyke family lived in the house from about the time of 1735 until the early 1900s. And at that time, a widow of a Van Skyke had married a gentleman by the name of W.L. Adams. And I've read letters to her from uh, the Lansings, the Ten Brooks, the Ten Ike, saying, stop him. He is selling your children's legacy. He is selling your heritage. Um, don't let him do that. And of course, under the law at that time, women couldn't own property and could, women could not have their own wealth. Ooh. And um, the, the husband had domain. And so the property was definitely sold. And it was at that time that the house left the Van Skyke family and then 
different families uh, ha have lived there. I've met the Buckleys who were there in the 40s, um, Canistraries, Charlie and Anna Canistrary, who owned the house, um, lived there until 2001. Mm -hmm. My uh, chapter of the Daughters of the American Revolution is the General Peter Gansevoort chapter, named for one of our very wonderful heroes of the American Revolution. Uh, we purchased it in 2001 from a, with a grant from the Department of Histor Historical, uh, I'm sorry, Parks and Recreation Historical Preservation. And uh, we, we purchased it from them and we had to have matching funds. So actually we had many people helping us. We had Jack McEnany, we had Paul Huey, we had John Albert, we had uh, a plethora of people. We had Ron Canistrary, we had a number of people who were uh, politically and historically connected mm -hmm. guiding us for the purchase of this house. It had been on the National Landmark of Historical Places since 1970. And um, we needed help to be able to um, figure out how to work through the, the labyrinth, really, of paperwork and, and uh, specifications for how do you purchase a historic building. Do many DAR chapters own historical buildings? There are, there are about, I want to say, 80 DAR chapters in New York State, about 18 of them do own oh, historic sites. Cool. Some of them are more, more recent, some of them are from the 1800s mm -hmm. or the early 1900s, mm -hmm. um, but there are some, yes, who have houses that go back to the time of the Revolutionary War. That's quite a... I don't want to say burden. That's that's quite a. It's a responsibility. Responsibility to assume. It's a responsibility. Yeah, yes. an ongoing one. It's not. It's it's. Yes. Sort of like a baby. <laughs> I mean, yeah. it's it's a lot. It's a commitment. <laughs> it is a huge commitment, yeah. and we've we have had some fundraising. We uh, replaced the roof in 2014. We fixed the basement in 2015, and this year we're hoping to get some storm windows on our. Second floor. All right. Well, we'll All things in good time. Yeah. <laughs> we'll and I'm sure there's a list for <laughs> oh, it's marching a, out. It's a never-ending well. list. It's like our houses, you know, or or our dwellings. They they need constant attention. Except that this one is uh, uh, coming up to 300 years old. Yes. Yeah, amazing. It is. And it's still in in very good shape from what I've seen of it. And it's in a charming location when you think about how how far back it goes in terms of mm. just above the river and looking over at Lansingburg, I guess, is on the other side. Of the yes, river. and you know, of course, that was where the Tories were. Well, I'm going to tell a story about it. Are you? Well, isn't that I, a perfect segue for you? That's a perfect segue. segue. <laughs> I want to take you back to, to one of the first uh, conversations that may have happened at the Van Schaik table as people began to strategize how to raise an army to take on the British. There was a family over in Lansingburg, and their name was McCrae. And like a lot of the families, they were divided. One of the sons, John, was in the uh, militia, the Albany militia, was close to the Schuyler family, and he was on the side of the Americans. But the mother and father were loyal to the king being McCrae, they were good in the Scotch-Irish line. And the daughter, Janie McCrae, was in love with a young lad who went north with the first wave of loyalists and took up a, a, a position in the loyalist army. And he was a lieutenant in the loyalist regiment that was fighting with Burgoyne. And she was pining away for him. Now, it was the custom of the day that women could follow their men into battle, almost into battle, but were camp followers. That's what they called them. And they would cook and clean and care for their men as they were getting ready to be soldiers in the war. So she, being a determined young woman in love, decided to go find her fiance. And she went up the river about a day's journey and stayed with her cousin, who was a lady that was known as the Widow McNeil. And the Widow McNeil was older than Janie McCrae. And she was large and big, and she could, she could take care of herself very well. So she had no fear of living in a cabin along the river mm. by herself. And Janie McCrae was welcomed there. And 
in the passing by, there were many of these spies and scouts that went on their way. And they'd stop by for water or maybe a meal at the widow O'Neill's. And two members of the Indian Corps of Burgoyne's army stopped by. And they saw the beautiful Janie McCrae. And they saw her cousin, the widow McNeil. And they offered to guide them through the lines of the Americans so that she could meet her lover. Well, they packed up their belongings and they went off with the Indians. And the Indians had no intention of really taking them all the way to her lover. They saw the fine beauty of the young woman and they didn't know what to do with the older woman. But then they got to fighting over who was going to have the beautiful Janie McCrae. And one Indian, in anger to his brother, decided he'd decide the situation and kill Janie McCrae so that neither would have her. But he would have her scalp because the British had put a bounty on American scalps. So they did that. And they scalped Janie McCrae right in front of the Widow McNeil. But the Widow McNeil had thin hair and her scalp wouldn't have been worth much. So they took her with her as prisoner. Now they get to Burgoyne's camp. And the custom was to turn in your scalps for your payment. Mm -hmm. And who was the paymaster for the British troops but the loyalist lieutenant? And they told the story about how they had tricked these two women and how the beautiful one with the raven hair and they laid the hair on the table and her fiance screamed and gasped and fainted because he was the hair buyer. Now, the British, you may ask me, how do I know all this detail? The British made a fatal mistake because the Widow McNeil was not a happy person. <laughs> and they didn't want to kill her, so they let her go. So as she traveled south, she told everyone she met about this terrible thing that had happened to the beautiful Jane McRae, who was a loyalist who got killed by the savages. Well, Philip Schuyler heard the story and interviewed the widow McNeil. And in the council of war, they decided to send storytellers far and wide through the colonies, through the Vermont, what was known as the Hampshire Grants at the time, through Massachusetts, through New York, through Connecticut, and tell the story of how this beautiful loyalist woman had been scalped by the savages. And by the time the Battle of Saratoga started, two months later, there were almost 10,000 volunteer militia who had left their homes, who had left their families to go against Burgoyne because they knew they had to stop Burgoyne or the Indians would come and scalp their families. And it was one of the prime motivators that swung the battle because of the mass of these militia troops. Now, the militia weren't the most effective fighters, but when you're calculating the odds about how a battle was gonna come out, their numbers made a difference. Mm -hmm. And that is the story of a story that turned the tide of war. And it was created a strategy around the table in the dining room of the Van Skyke Mansion. In Albany. In Cahos. Cahos. Oh, Van Skyke, I'm Van Skyke. sorry. Van Skyke. That was General Schuyler's headquarters. He had moved. Right. Part. Even though he was Okay, cool. So that was, that's one of the stories that uh, we're going to tell at a fundraiser that we're going to have on October 21st. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm not good with numbers. I, uh, I have the, the flyer in yeah. front of me. <laughs> and, and, and so we're going to kind of segue is that into our current events, and we can have Joanna kind of talk about what's going to happen on the 21st. It will start in the middle of the month. Right, Sounds okay. Sounds good. Yeah, so we'll we'll be open. We'll uh, welcome families and, uh, of course, children and adults. All all people are of all ages. Nancy Marie Payne and Joe Doolittle are our uh, wonderful tellers, and 
uh, we're going to have a tour of the cemetery. Like a lot of colonial homes, there is a cemetery attached to the house that is um, that goes back to that date of 1735, the purchase of the house, and it will play a role in the evening. There's going to be a, a really good storyteller telling ghost stories, historical ghost stories, scary things mm -hmm. in that cemetery. And uh, when Nancy Payne and I talked about this, we decided that the house isn't really big enough for like two different storytellers to be telling at the same time, so that Nancy's going to tell scary stories and stories of the historical period in the house, and I'm going to be outside in the graveyard telling ghost stories. With a flashlight under your face? <laughs> Actually, it's going to be scary. Yeah, I'm going to, I, I think it's, it, it, when we thought this up, we said, you know, unless it rains. Now, Joanna has a, a plan B. Oh, I'm, I'm If sure. it rains, where we'll am I going to be telling stories? Oh, no, you are, where? Are, uh, in the garage. In the garage. In the yeah. garage. In the, garage. <laughs> in, in the historical garage. We're going to be, so we'll have it covered. Well, you can, well, you can be in the garage. I've heard garage bands. That's well, this is, <laughs> this is a huge space, and okay. we'll, we'll set up tables and chairs, and it will, it will be dry. It, it will, will be, be safe. Yes. Yes. Yeah, that's yes. Um, so we, and we will have uh, refreshments that will be complimentary that will go with the uh, the evening the cider and donuts and um, we'll have you know some uh, hot chocolate and it'll it should be a wonderful wonderful evening wonderful event the uh, some of the our local funeral parlors are supporting us with our fundraising Good. on this part so. We're looking forward to it. It'll be a lot of fun. And and it really, the house has been restored to a, a real colonial feel. So there's a, a, a little bit of a museum atmosphere. There's certainly the feel of the house. There'll be folks that can talk about the house there. And I, I encourage you to come out for that because uh, both as the fundraiser for the support and also to, to acquire a little knowledge about some of the things that happened in our community that have affected the way we live and, and work to this day. To this day, exactly. To this day. Exactly. So what else are we doing in storytelling? And we'll come back to you, Joanna. And, and, yes. 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 and I, I have a comment to follow your Janie um, McRae story. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. So, uh, so. Uh, but, so back to the beginning of the month. On October 4th, Joe's uh, series at Arthur's Market in Historic, um, a stockade section of Schenectady. First Tuesday Tales and Stuff is featuring the poet David Walsh. Uh, favorite poems and stories about poems and poets is the topic. And David's a is a computer geek in his other life. Uh, has been writing poetry for about 20 years and I discovered his interest uh, at a church meeting. He goes to the Scotia Reformed Church. And I said to him, David, what's the most interesting thing you've been doing? He said, probably ha having people listen to my poetry. And I said, wow, I could, we could probably help you with that. Um, so he's, this is his second visit to uh, First Tuesdays. And he's a wonderful poet and a, and a good raconteur. And he will be the feature. And we encourage all of you who might want to come and share a poem of your own or uh, read or recite a favorite poem or tell a story about a poet. The goops, they lick their fingers. The goops, they lick their knives. They <laughs> spill their broth on the tablecloth. Oh, they lead disgusting lives. The goops, they talk while speaking, while loud and fast they chew. I am glad that I am not a goop. Are you? <laughs> I'm afraid so. <laughs> <laughs> Where, who, 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 is that a Dr. Zeus? Um, is that Shel Silverstein? I don't know. It was uh, in my parents gave me when I was eight <laughs> for Christmas. Oh, not the Reader's Digest Guide to Children's Literature, <laughs> and there's this picture of ghostly children, messy children eating around a table and then this poem which About the clearly caught my eye. I and was <laughs> going to say and, and, and was forged in your memory. Yes. I, think just, yeah. Yeah. I do know others um, <laughs> but oh that's right I could come. You could the, come the and do this. That Paul Child wrote for Julia for her 40th birthday. There you could go. That was a great birthday. story. Great story. That's, 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 great that's story. a wonderful thing. Anyways, I digress. Sorry. But that's, you know, any kind of poem would be welcome any. from from your past or Mary Oliver, if you don't have any, try her. Try her. Mm. Try her. 
Then the Saratoga Storytelling Open Mic is always on the second Wednesday of the month. And in October, it will be, that's October 12th. And it's at the Woodlawn Commons, which is a senior residence just west of um, Skidmore. And it's free when it's there. We alternate with being there and at Cafe Lena. Last night, we weren't at Cafe Lena because it's under construction. So we were at the Spring Street Gallery, and we'll be there in November. But it goes on. If, if the building isn't there, we, we find some place else. Right. <laughs> then um, another series Joe started, the Shawnee Evenings at the Irish American Heritage Museum. That's going to be on the third Friday? The third Friday because of the holiday and the schedule of Dan Bergen and Janine Laverty. Okay, so it's going to be, you, 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 that's opposite the, the, the Van Scott. I know, I know. It, it, it How came are you going up, to be both places, Joe? I'm, I'm going to get a substitute oh, okay. to MC. <laughs> what are you doing on the 21st? No, no. I, uh, <laughs> It was, but, uh, and, and Daniel, Dan Bergen is just a great uh, raconteur and, and songster, and mm. Janine is a great storyteller, and that'll be themed on the Irish and the Adirondacks. So we'll have and, the Dutch up in the Cohoes, and we'll have the. And, mm. and Dan's songs are stories, and he has a wonderful voice, and he accompanies himself on the guitar. And Janine was my first storytelling teacher, and. Um, Wonderful, wonderful storyteller. Yeah. Oh, but the Van Skyk <laughs> also has Nancy and so f flip a coin, flip a coin. Unfortunately, they're at the same time. So. Well, and unfortunately, since I'll be up at the Van Skyke house, I won't be leading my normal pub crawl afterwards through <laughs> okay. Albany. So. Oh, and I'm slightly out of order date-wise, but the previous Sunday on the 16th at uh, Salem, we have a spin-off series at Salem, mm -hmm. Word Plays at the Cabaret in the fall. The topic is Waterloo. Waterloo. People who have met their Waterloo and perhaps have overcome it, unlike ah. Napoleon. That was... <laughs> that Napoleon was for got him. sent to St. Helena. He got, yes, he, yes. Got he, he, he had had a comeback. He, they tried to send him away once, but Waterloo was... Well, not really. He didn't die there. But So um, we have Claire Beetlestone, Buddy Mayan, Barbara Palumbo, Nancy, the famous Nancy Marie Payne, okay. and Joe Peck will be telling Waterloo stories there. Mm. Then on October 19th, uh, we'll have our story circle meeting. And the purpose of the story circle meetings are for people to share stories, telling them, not reading them. You could have some notes that you glance at, but we really don't want you reading your story. Um, at the Pine Hills branch of Albany Public Library. And we will start with, we start at 6.15 and have a 45 minute, some sort of learning session someone shares some knowledge or has read an article and shares that. Um, and then from seven to nine, we have story sharings. And you can, you can get as much or as little feedback as you want. Sometimes it's such a brand new story that you just want to ta tell it to living faces. faces and, right. and that's enough. You don't, want to, you don't want to hear about its warts. Uh, <laughs> but sometimes you know you've, you're stuck. And, and you welcome, you know, what isn't clear? Um, do, you, and do you have any suggestions? Um, and I think, it's very, very helpful. I think that one of the reasons that Story Circle, our local guild, exists is to help people who are interested in becoming storytellers or using story in their teaching or their work uh, get better. And one of the ways we do that is at these monthly meetings. So for those of you who are curious about uh, storytelling and want to kind of touch it a little bit, we encourage you to come to one of the, 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 um, our monthly sessions because it's where we share and it's where we learn together. And uh, it's where most of us started when we kind of stumbled into the, the storytelling world. So be encouraged. Among all the performances we talk about, a lot of the learning starts with our, our, with our monthly meetings. And I've always found, some people say, oh, I, I can't tell in front of storytellers because they know so much. 
Mm. But I find, oh, I love to tell in front of storytellers because they know so much <laughs> that they know where I am, that I'm, I'm at the beginning, I'm birthing a story and it's painful and it's hard yeah. and, and they're sympathetic so um, and encouraging. And if you forget a word, they'll supply it. Okay. Oh, and also, on, on my goodness, on Friday, October 21st, uh, there's the a monthly series that Janet Carter runs down in Saugerties. So if you're in the southern area of our viewing distance and don't uh, viewing area and don't want to drive a distance, you can go to Saugerties at 7 p.m. at the Inquiring Minds Bookstore. Love that name. Inquiring Minds. Uh, and Janet has a guest every month. I don't know who it is this And it, that's a wonderful little place to tell, too, because yes. it's, yes. a, it's a bookstore with a little open space and hardwood floors. That and a little, great, little uh, cafe. I'm not sure you can get a sandwich, but you can get some goodies and, and, and some drinks. And then this, the last one I'm going to mention is in the early November. But depending on when your you, your locality um, shows our our show, I thought I'd mention it. Waterloo stories will be also at Proctor's on November sixth, Sunday, up in the Fenimore Gallery on the second floor above the box office. And Claire Beadle, some of the same people who were telling Waterloo stories in Salem, will be telling them. At Proctor's, Claire Beetlestone, Joe Doolittle, Bonnie Mayan, Elliot Nieves, Barbara Palumbo, Nancy Marie Payne, and Joe Peck. So we have some ringers. Uh, some, some. Definitely, there'll be some new stories. So you could go to both of them. Um, and that's what I have for the upcoming things. Uh, also, uh, so do you have any others up well, your sleeve? <laughs> well, we have uh, we have a story Sunday coming, don't we? <gasps> we have yes, story we Sunday have a story Sunday. With new, uh, new slide, story Sunday. New okay, <laughs> story Sunday on October 23rd. I did this late last night, I'm sorry. Uh, no, I, I um, and, and, and now you can see the slide in front of you that will be made shortly. Uh, <laughs> with Jim Hawkins, um. who, is, who was born in Ireland, just outside of Mullingar. And it's one of the special events associated with the Capitol Rep's performance of the play, Outside Side Mullingar. Mullingar. And he'll be telling Irish stories and songs. Uh, he's a delightful teller. He lives on Long Island now. That's why we can afford to have him That's right. come. <laughs> and he was a school teacher for a long time. Yes. Uh, but has always maintained an interest in his Irish roots and culture. Um, and he's just kind of a a sparkling-eyed, wonderful storyteller, and that's going to be a great evening. And um, So it's October 23rd at 5, and for one price, you get the entertainment, a three-course meal with a choice of three different entrees, the uh, coffee and tea, tax and tip, yeah. all-inclusive. For thirty-seven dollars, and it's one of Angelo Mazzone's fine dinners. Yes, yes. So, and, um, so um, yeah. if you haven't tried it, <laughs> there's a we have a little story Sunday satisfaction survey. It has four questions on it, and the last <laughs> question is, um, how did you come? How did you get here? Uh, and my favorite response was, well, my wife made me come, and I knew at least I'd get a good meal. <laughs> and I'll come back for the, for the stories. And I usually drive to Glen Sanders. That's how I got there. Okay. <laughs> yeah, the, the, I don't have the wording quite right on that. But if you can come to any of these wonderful events, and the new series of TV shows is leaving you lacking, you can go to our website, storycircleatproctors.org, and we have over 150 stories that you can watch on your computer. Stories on demand. Mostly from filmed in this very spot. Most of the so, guests. So there's a black background <laughs> behind some of Sometimes there's a, a green mug that we've forgotten to take out of the frame. And uh, humorous, historical, personal, traditional. Yep. 
and they're and they're all there. So if things are dull on TV, which is most of the time, you can just dial mm -hmm. up or go to the website. Mm -hmm. And there's also a lot of information about. Speaking of websites, uh, does does the <laughs> does the Van Skyke Mansion have a website? We do. It's the Van. It's Van Skyke Mansion dot org. Dot org. And so folks can go there to find out some of the details on the on the coming program, as well as some historical connections on the house. That's right. And uh, pictures of for some of our events that we've had. We've had reenactments. We've had Heritage Day. And so there are there are things that people can see of the house. And it's not a virtual tour, but it will show some of the the, the important pieces. I, I'm curious. Are there are there any Van Skykes? involved on your board or in Cohoes or what's happened to the family? Not, not there, but they are around us. Oh, they good. are, um, th some of, we, we've met people from all over the country who are of their, um, their heritage is, is connected to the Van Skyke Mansion. They are Van Skykes. Mm -hmm. um, they are not on the board. They are, uh, none of them are members of our chapter. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, but they they are friends of the mansion. Oh, good. good. And they, they help us, yes. And people can become a friend of the mansion. Absolutely. Come and uh, participate in what we're doing, sign up, and we would love to have you be one of our friends. Mm -hmm. So um, after you, the, uh, we've learned that the Van Skyke Mansion was a staging area for the early, uh, during the Revolution, Revolutionary mm -hmm. War. Mm -hmm. Um, did it, uh, what happened after that? <laughs> well, well, I got it. I, I, I'm going to tell, I'd like to tell one more story Go about ahead. things that happened and then we'll come back to kind of the, the next steps for the uh, mansion. Is that okay. okay? Okay. Well, before you do that, I had a follow up. Oh, oh. You, you were saying that the power of Janie McRae's story mm -hmm. and how it was strategically used to involve people in the revolution. And I wanted to share a little nugget. I read that in Russia, long, long time ago, when the powers shifted, when, when somebody conquered an area, yeah. the first thing they would do is cut, off, cut out the tongues of all the storytellers. Mm. Well, that'd be, I don't yeah, know. yeah, yeah, we, we, we kind of stuck there uh, because they were the ones that had the power of telling the story of the previous, previous. regime, and they didn't want th those stories told anymore. Oh. <laughs> well, it, well if you, I could, you got a very visceral reaction to that. I, 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 if I could tell a story about scalping, I, I can do that. This this story is a little bit lighter, but has a lot of bloodshed in it. <laughs> And uh, <laughs> blood light. <laughs> blood light. It's July of 1777, and George Washington is anxious because he knows all this activity is going on up north, and he's got the British surrounded in New York, and he wants to help General Gates. General Schuyler has just been replaced. Gates isn't the person that Philip Schuyler was, so he's worried about that. So he decides to send a dis defining presence to the battle at, eventually at Saratoga. He sends two regiments north, light infantry. One was under the command of Colonel Daniel Morgan from Virginia, and there were about 700 riflemen. And they couldn't put bayonets on their rifles, who were rifled to shoot long distances, so they carried tomahawk, tomahawks instead of bayonets. And they were ferocious fighters. They proved their worth many times to Washington. And next to them was a light infantry division led by a fellow named Henry Dearborn. And they started north, and they arrived at the Van Skyke Mansion in early August, just as word was coming in about the terrible battle at Oriskany, where General Herkimer had gone to the relief of Fort Stanwyck, which the British had surrounded and had been ambushed by their former neighbors, loyalists and Mohawk Indians, and half of them had been killed or wounded. It was a very bloody day, and that added to the anxiety. And there was a council of war, because Burgoyne was threatening from the north, and St. Ledger from the west. 
And in comes these two elite regiments. So the decision is made that somebody has to go to the relief of Fort Stanley. And everybody was nervous, but nobody wanted to go way off to the west. But Benedict Arnold said he'd lead troops if he could take Morgan and Dearborn's troops with him, because they could move fast. So they set out. And as they were heading up the river, they got to a place near Herkimer. And there was a tavern there. And after the, after the Battle of Oriskany, spies were sent down to try to foment more unrest. And there was a young loyalist, a dandy by the name of Walter Butler. And he was well known in the valley because his father was the chief right hand to General John Burgoyne. And he was recruiting people in the tavern when Arnold and his men showed up. And Arnold knew him instantly. And Arnold grabbed him by the neck and dragged him out of the tavern and said, get a rope. Get a rope. We're going to hang this traitor right here. Because Arnold wanted to make a statement about the recruitment process and what happened to traitors. Well, the Valley people didn't want to see Walter Butler hung because they were a little nervous because he was kind of family even though he was on the other side. And Arnold wouldn't back off. Butler was traveling with a fellow named Yost Schuyler who was a storyteller. He was a glad guy, loved a pint of ale, and he kind of came up and started to talk to Schuyler, to, to Arnold. Arnold wouldn't have any of it. And then as he looked at this buffoon, he got an idea. He said to him, take off your coat. So Schuyler took off his coat. They nailed it on the wall of the tavern, and he said to his men, shoot at the coat. They shot at the coat. And Joseph and Schuyler was just glad he wasn't in the coat. Yeah. And then Arnold says to him, you see those guys over there? Those guys with the rifles and the tomahawks? That's Morgan's riflemen. You see those guys over there? They're from New Hampshire, and they got tomahawks on their belts, too, and they got bayonets on their guns, and they're mean and nasty. That's Dearborn's troop. I got 1,500 men with me. That's not what they got up there, but it's enough to take care of business. So if you know what's good for you, I want you to go up there, and I want you to tell a story. And I want you to tell the story that I'm coming with Morgan and Dearborn, and we've got more soldiers than the leaves on the trees. And if those Indians and British know what's good for them, they'll leave town. That's all I got to do. If you don't do it, I'll find you, and I'll cut your heart out of your chest while it's still beating. <laughs> so Yost Ben Schuyler goes up to Fort Stanwyck. Now, during the Battle of Oriskany, while the fiancé of Catherine Van Skyk, a guy named Gainsworth, he was in command of that fort, and he ordered his lieutenant, second in command, to sally forth while the British and the Indians were fighting, and they raided the camp, and they stole all their blankets and their cooking pots and their food. So when they got back from this bloody battle, they didn't have a pot to cook in. And they were very disconsolate. Then they just had to wait. And then Joseph and Schuyler comes up and says, look at my coat. They shot at me as I was getting away. They got Butler. They were going to hang him. I don't know what's going on, but you better get out of here because they got more soldiers and leaves on the trees. Well, the Indians didn't have to hear that more than once before they packed up what little they had left. And all of a sudden, they were headed toward Lake Ontario. The Loyalist troops were right behind them. And St. Ledger, he didn't have anything to do but pack it up and leave. And the next day, when Morgan's guys got up there, there was nobody around but the Americans. So they had brought food and they had brought supplies. They slept a long sleep, rested all the next day, and they marched all the way back to Cohoes. And then they marched north. And two days later, after reaching Saratoga on the 5th of September, Morgan and Dearborn led the U.S. forces into battle against the British who were trying to turn their right at a place called Freeman's Farm. And Morgan and Dearborn basically helped turn the tide of that battle. 
and the American army held the British back. And that was the beginning of the end for Burgoyne's army. Mm -hmm. And the story there is really that the battle, as terrible as they are, sometimes can be won by a really good story. There you go. <laughs> Joost van Dyck and the army that was as plentiful as leaves on the trees. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Excellent. Right. Excellent. So the intelligence that went on in this house was pretty significant in terms of the councils of war and the, the things. Um, and then as the, now Gainsworth and Catherine mm -hmm. were married in the house 1780-ish something? 1778. 1778. So the year after all this had gone on. Mm -hmm. And well, actually, uh, it, it was January. January. So it was, so it was just a few months, few months after all this. After everything was going on. Wow. Can you imagine yeah. having all that happen in your life and then getting married in the middle of a war? Because Gainsworth went back to fight in the valley for another three years. Anyway. Mm -hmm. And uh, just... He and that Marnus Willett, his lieutenant, became the principal uh, soldiers in defending the valley from the subsequent raids of the of the British and the Indians. Um, so he 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 was quite a personality as a soldier. And didn't he go on and fight in the War of eighteen twelve? Yeah, I'm not did. sure. Did he? Yeah, he mm -hmm. was he was a general in command, kind of the Philip Schuyler in terms of the logistics wow. between all the fighting that went on up in Lake Champlain and Sackett's Harbor. Um, so he, he remained very much in the military uh, scene for a long time. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. uh, when you look ahead to things you'd like to see happen, uh, this program in the 24th, 21st, um, do you have other events? planned throughout the year that are going to be areas that the community might touch the, the, the mansion? We, with our website, we we announce what our different events are, yes. Uh, Heritage Day, we try to have reenactors come, mm -hmm. and this past year we had um, them there as well as a blacksmith who was selling wares. We have had uh, the opportunity of having p people who are pers become the personas of James Madison and um, uh, Alexander Hamilton and... Um, Benjamin Franklin, mm -hmm. and they will come and they will give presentations. We're going to be having the New York State Museum doing some excavations on the property beginning in October this year just to get a preliminary and then next year actually going through to see if they can find if there are any um, enslaved persons, their burial site, mm -hmm. and so that we can have them properly mm -hmm. interred. and. Um, it's constantly evolving. Mm -hmm. We are uh, excited about the, uh, this is a new venture for us. We are trying to make the house more than just a historic site. It's a place where people will come and enjoy the, the property, um, see the kinds of things that, it, it's, it's a historic house in a contemporary time. Mm -hmm. So we are, that's why we're having the, the ghost stories, the scary stories, mm -hmm. the, the historical stories. The first annual? Bring those, the first annual, <laughs> followed by, by many more. I'm not going to say, mm -hmm. you know, but, but storytelling is a wonderful way to reach out to the community. Mm -hmm. and we've had uh, Joe Bruchock, and we have had Kay Olin, and we have had um, Darren uh, Bonaparte, and, uh, mm -hmm. come and give the stories of wampum and tell the stories of, of the um, the other side of the story. Mm -hmm. The other side of the story. Yeah. So, Originals. Yeah, story. and um, and I think that's really incredible. We we are un we're in the process of uncovering some of the, the hidden stories. We don't know the stories of the enslaved people mm -hmm. that were at mm -hmm. the house. We've, we, one of the things that one of our rest, uh, preservationists found last year was a brick that has the handprints of a child on it because the children of enslaved persons could shape the bricks. Mm -hmm. And that wall of the basement is three feet thick. 
the whole house is brick. That's a hidden story. We've owned the house since 2001. We never knew that brick was there mm -hmm. until he was doing the work on it. Mm -hmm. So the house has more to reveal to us. And as we learn it, we will share it with the public. Right. If only the walls could talk. If only they could. And honestly, they are talking. It's just we have to look at them with the right <laughs> eyes and see and see what's there. Exactly. There's a, there's a phrase from um, Baudelaire, the French poet, about the need to listen with the ears of our hearts. It's true. true. Yeah. It's absolutely true. Yeah. Well, you and your group are truly doing that, and it, and it is exciting. And, and you're wonderful stewards of these memories and these stories. Um, and the rest of us are, are really uh, fortunate to have you guys uh, active doing the, what you're doing. And the, the house itself is at 1 Van Schaik Avenue, Avenue uh, on the island. Uh, and if you follow signs toward the, uh, in the to the Peebles? Coho's Country Club, or Van Schaik Island Country Club? Van Schaik Country Club. Van Schaik Country Club. And when you get to the parking lot, you kind of go to the left and take a right. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, and look on your left. That's and I true. say that because if you try to follow real directions, you'll never find them. <laughs> no, no. It does look as if you're in the driveway of the Country Club. You just keep going around the pond that's there yeah. and keep going and you will, you will get there. You will and get we, there. And we hope to see you there. Will you, will you have a path lit with lanterns? We will <laughs> have luminaries out. We will we will be ready for you, yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or, or historic figures going. <laughs> that way. Well, there are, we are on the uh, New York State Heritage Trail, Heritage mm -hmm. Trail for the American Revolution. There are signs. There is signage. Um, we are 12047, so you can find it, you know, with your GPS. You will get there. Mm -hmm. It's, um, Start a little early, maybe. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Hopefully, there'll be enough flow that that you just just follow the car. Just call, follow the crowd. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and it and it will be worth the trip. I can guarantee you that you'll discover uh, a piece of your own hometown that mm -hmm. you didn't know was there, that uh, is charming in its way. It's an old house, but has this wonderful story and a and a piece of American history to it uh, that is worth learning and remembering. Mm -hmm. So that's going to be what's going to happen. Yes. I have, I, we, we have three, two minutes. And I have, I remembered a story that Kathleen Gill used to tell oh. about uh, the English going uh, east on the Mohawk. And there was a woman there who was all alone at her farm with her children. And she could see in the distance that the English were burning the farms. Mm -hmm. Yes? Mm -hmm. Yes. And so to protect her own farm, first she had her children take all the animals into the woods. And then she started a fire. I think it was the tallow that she was going to use to make soap. But as she started burning it, and it caused a big smoky cloud to come up. And it, it worked just the way she thought. The British were coming down the road, and they said, oh, we don't have to go there. Somebody's, Somebody's already, already been there. I don't know who. We'll, we'll go further. And so that's how a, a, a mother, a wife, saved her homestead and her, and her family. Um, out of sheer desperation, she came up with this plan. <laughs> Boy, that's a great story. Yeah, that's a good story, yeah. mm -hmm. and it undoubtedly, it undoubtedly happened. Mm -hmm. uh, Kathleen had had the all the information. I, uh, but I remember that and, and thinking mm -hmm. she probably burst into sobs right. when yeah. she was when she saw the fires ahead of them. Right, that they were safe. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's a. It, it is a different time, uh, it was a different time, but then when you see the news of what's going on in Syria and Iraq, yeah. um, unfortunately it's still going on, but uh, yeah. it's not going on in our neighborhood. So thank you very much for joining us today. We hope you'll come back another time. We hope you'll, c you'll come to some of our storytelling events. And uh, as I like to say to folks, good cheer. Have a great month. Goes all my life's a circle, sunrise and sundown. The moon rolls through the night time till the daybreak comes around. And 
And all my life's a circle But I can't tell you why Seasons spinning round 